It's now time for the Weekly with New 6 Morning Anchor, Justin Warmith. This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Good morning, I'm Justin Warmith. Black History Month begins tomorrow, and News 6 will be bringing you stories every day, highlighting the people past and present who have made an impact on Central Florida. This morning, Larry Colleton, the president of the Orange County chapter of the Florida Voters League, is here to discuss some of the African Americans who died in pursuits of having the right to vote. Let, let's talk about uh, what you're doing right now and how you're helping voters in the Central Florida area, um, especially black voters. Well, I'm the president of the Orange County chapter of the Florida Voters League. Mm -hmm. And there are three goals that we have. Um, one is to register um, individuals to, to vote. Mm -hmm. The second is an educational process of uh, educating um, the community about not just simply the importance of voting, but also what is actually happening politically. You know, what are the issues in, in trying to help e educate the community about that? And the third is to emphasize that once you are registered and you are an informed voter, that you actually participate in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, because simply registering an individual to vote doesn't guarantee that that individual will vote. Mm -hmm. So that's those are the three uh, goals we set, education, registration, and obviously participation in the process. Let's get into the education. Um, and so many people who have uh, fought to have the right to vote, so many African-Americans over the last several years, 100, 100 years or so, uh, fighting for the chance to vote and have their voices heard. Um, what, what sticks out to you, uh, if you want to localize it on the, uh, from the central Florida uh, aspect of, of the people who paved the way for this to even happen? I think I, I would at least identify two. There are many. Mm -hmm. uh, one would be July Perry uh, from Okoe, and the other would be Harry T. Moore uh, from MEMS, Florida. Uh, Mr. Perry uh, wanted to vote in the 1920 National the election, mm -hmm. and um, he was not allowed to. He uh, actually went to court to, to make that happen for him. And I mean, his efforts literally resulted in his death and the deaths of several others. And literally, um, African-Americans were forcibly <laughs> removed from Okoe. They had to leave because they were being killed, yeah. uh, their homes uh, burn um, and their lives threatened. So it took some 40 or 50 years before African-Americans even returned to the, the city of Okoe. Uh, so that's a recent phenomenon in, in, in the last 40 years, I think people started returning there and mm -hmm. it's a, 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 a growing community today. Mm -hmm. That is the history of a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moore, uh, was the first state president of uh, the NAACP, and he started creating NAACP units or branches throughout the state in the 1930s. Um, part of that was to register voters, and, and he is one of the founders of what is, it's the initial organization that became the Florida Voters League, mm -hmm. um, the Progressive Voters League, is what he and one other person started in Florida back in the 1940s. And that was to register voters and, and to register black voters mm -hmm. and register them in a particular party. And there was a reason for that. So it was not a nonpartisan organization when it started. It is today, but it wasn't then. His goal was to register as many African-Americans as possible in the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. because if, if you if if you were running for governor or attorney general, if whoever the Democratic nominee was, that is likely to be the next governor or the next attorney general, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted African Americans to have influence within the party that was controlling the state. Uh, and during a, a period of about five years or so, he registered over four hundred thousand. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, that's, and, that's unbelievable. And, and to, to think that 
you know, back to uh, July Perry and um, the Okoe massacre, uh, people need to realize, I, I think that this was just buried in history and, and only really in the last several years has this become well known uh, to the public. Um, but this was only 100 years ago and people were killed because they fought for the right to vote. Mm. To, I mean, that is, that is something that I think that really people need to understand is that this was not that long ago, only 100 years. Right, only 100 years. Well, only, it's only been 100 years that women mm. have been allowed to vote. <laughs> right. so just a few generations uh, ago, women were not allowed to vote. So you had the suppression of Black voter participation mm -hmm. and the absolute non-allowance of women to participate in the democratic process. Mm. The suppression, Black suppression, voter suppression today still um, looms. Uh, what, do you, what do you see just uh, when it comes to voter suppression um, in this country today? Well, it's uh, actually very disappointing um, what is actually happening. Um, just recently with our national election in, in November, 2020, um, we had the highest number of Americans voting ever. 155 million Americans voted, voted in a pandemic. <laughs> Um, putting their lives uh, at risk, health and, and potentially their lives at risk. At the same time, you see efforts to make voting much more difficult. And there is regrettably, but we have to be real about it. There is a racial element to this voter suppression as it was a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. um, look, America has to deal with its, its problems. And, and one of the major issues in America is race. You would, I am disappointed that we are still talking about race at this level. Mm -hmm. But it is, and, and it may be uncomfortable for some, but if you look at the efforts made post the national election to basically point out Philadelphia, Milwaukee, Detroit, Atlanta, all of those are majority black cities. And those are the targets for the challenge to the legitimacy mm -hmm. of the election. And there was no election fraud, mm -hmm. but that became the, the, the subject, the, this, what some are now calling the big lie. Mm -hmm. but, but that big lie was supported and it resulted in the siege on our nation's capital. I, I, that's now a little over three weeks ago, and I am more disturbed today than I was on the day watching it. Mm. I do believe that not only the participants, the active participants in it, but those who incited it, mm -hmm. they all need to be held accountable for it. Coming up, Mr. Colleton will talk about the case of the Groveland Four and why exoneration is the next step in the push to fix one of Florida's most brutal injustices. We'll be right back. This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Welcome back. The case of the Groveland Four has remained a disturbing example of racial injustice from the Jim Crow era. Four black men wrongly convicted of raping a white woman in 1949. Today, those men have been pardoned by the Florida cabinet, but there are growing calls for them to be exonerated. Here's the president of the Orange County chapter of the Florida Voters League, Larry Colleton. Well, that story sort of um, 
gets at where I started by talking about Harry T. Moore. Mm -hmm. um, that incident happened in July of 1949. The trial began September, early September 1949. Um, one was shot by a posse led by um, Willis McCall. Uh, he was killed in Madison County, Florida. The other three were tried. One was a juvenile and he was convicted and sentenced to life. And the two adults, both of whom were World War II veterans, uh, Shepard and Irving were, were sentenced to death. Now, their sentences were reversed by the US Supreme Court in 1951. And the sheriff went to Rayford to pick them up for their retrial. Um, they were shackled. He claimed on his way back, once he got into Lake County, but not to the Lake County Jail, that he had car problems. And when he got out the check, these two shackled men jumped him. And that forced him to defend his life by shooting them. Shepard was killed. They thought Thomas was dead, but he actually survived. And he gave his testimony, but he was not believed. Now, when this shooting took place, Mr. Moore began to send off letters to the attorney general of the state of Florida, to the governor of the, of, of the state of Florida, to the attorney general of the United States, that how can we continue to have Willis McCall as a sheriff? Um, within weeks, on, on his 25th wedding anniversary, Mr. Moore was assassinated. His home was bombed. In that home was his wife, his mother, and his oldest daughter. Um, he died on Christmas day, night. His wife lived another eight or nine days I think, until January 2nd, 1952. And there are those, you know, no one has ever been held accountable. There have been numerous investigations even within, I think when Charlie Chris was the attorney general, he did an investigation. They identified what they believed to be the suspects, but no one ever was tried for the Moore's assassination. But it is the Groveland case and the fact that Mr. Moore was really trying to get Willis McCall removed. Mm -hmm. the, it is suspected that the Klan, which was very, uh, prevalent in Orange County um, did it. The pardoning, back to back to that, you know, there, there have been, there's a book written about Devil in the Grove, um, about McCall and the case and, and what he has uncovered. Um, the author of that book is, is truly remarkable and I think led to the pardoning um, of these gentlemen. Exoneration though, and you know, some people might say, hey, what, they've been pardoned, that's, that's good. But why is exoneration even more important? Because it means they didn't do it. The pardon says you did it, but we're letting you, <laughs> we're gonna forgive you for it. And exoneration is you didn't do it. And this is uh, the Groveland Four were called the Little Scottsboro because back in the 1930s, in Scottsboro, Alabama, nine men were accused of, uh, nine black men were accused of, of, of raping a white woman. Um, so the word of the white woman <laughs> versus these four black men. And, um, two were shot to death and the other two spent a number of years in prison before they were released. Were you surprised to see um, the accuser uh, speak um, during during the the hearings at, at the Capitol? Uh, no, <laughs> no. It, it, it's ironic. She's the only one still living. That is ironic. Um, 
you know, as we move on to, uh, as we wrap this up, I, I just want to sort of put a button on this and, and ask you, because I think people celebrate and reflect differently. So when it comes to personal, how you will view and how you um, appreciate Black History Month, what, what does it mean to you? Well, um, as a child, it was called Negro History Week. And then as an adult, it became Black History Month. I, my, my reflection is this. Um, I, I don't particularly like just the emphasis in the month of February <laughs> because see, Black history in America is American history. <laughs> And so we should be discussing it all the time, not just in the month of February. Mm -hmm. And it should be a part of our regular curriculum because it's American history. Um, partly so that people can, if you don't know your history, and if you don't know the history, um, history has a way of repeating itself. Mm. And some of this is not good. Mm. And I, I think that if you look at the January 6, 2021 conduct, I, I mean, that's, we haven't, that, that's equivalent to the firing on Fort Sumter in Charleston that began the American Civil War. Um, the, the current president, President Biden, described our conduct in America as an uncivil war. I don't think there was anything uncivil about what occurred on January 6th. So we all um, need to take note of what occurred and that the attitude of, of um, why that happened. And it happened because people believe a lie. And it's really important for us all to speak truth to power. I want to thank Mr. Colleton for his time this week. Again, we have a special section of our website dedicated to the history of the African-American community in Central Florida. Just head to clickorlando.com slash Black History Month. I'm Justin Mormoth. Hope you have a great Sunday.